Welcome to another episode of What Do You Really Think? I'm Buck Saxon. With me as always is... Mark Lamont Hill. And we have a special treat for all of you this week. The one, the only, Candace Owens joins us now. Hello, Candace. Hello, guys. It's so nice to join you, gentlemen. I, that's so, so, Mark, how are we going to do this? How are we going to share Candace's time here on the show? There's so many questions. There's so much to talk about, but first of all, this is probably this is such a special episode that people are going to be watching this on YouTube, not just on the normal platform. So a lot of you will be watching the show for the first time, and you can always subscribe. So we really want you to do that. So make sure you subscribe. And it was a quick dot quake media quakemedia dot com slash mark quakemedia dot com slash buck. And yes, absolutely, please do subscribe to the site. You get access to all kinds of amazing shows there. And with that, Mark, do you, well, Mark, why don't I let you kick it off? Because I, you know, I, mean, I don't I, want I, you to feel ganged up on here. I just want to say that I'm, I, I feel very safe. I'm very confident. I'm a very confident <laughs> guy. And I'm playing with house money right now. So first of all, for those that don't know, uh, 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 Buck and I had a bet mm. in the election. Uh, so Buck owes me a very fancy sushi dinner. He will. So he will pay up. Yes, I'm feeling very, very good uh, about that. So. Uh, I watched Rudy Giuliani have hair dye dripping down his face uh, this week. And I'm, I'm not like the person who finds pleasure in other people's misery or anything like that. But to me, it kind of spotlighted like the absurdity of what's happening, you know, uh, uh, over the last a couple of weeks. And then lastly, for me, uh, another interesting thing, whole different thing was in rap music. Gucci Mane and Young Jeezy had a versus where they squashed the beef and buried the hatchet. So I'm feeling very positive. I'm feeling very upbeat. I, I couldn't be any better right now. And I got sushi coming. I don't even have to pay for it. Yeah, Candace, I, I can know. tell you, this has been Mark's vibe since <laughs> since the day after the election or so. He's been very happy. He's been very happy-go-lucky. You know, he's feeling good about life. Let's let's start, though. Candace, what, what do you think? I mean, he brought up the Rudy Giuliani press conference, and Rudy's one of a, a handful of lawyers who are looking uh, at, at these issues for the president. Just what's your over? What do you think about all this with the fraud and the irregularities? And where, where are you? Um, well, first and foremost, when I saw that Rudy Giuliani was trending over hair dye, um, usually when the left resorts to a physical attack and that becomes the focus, it's sort of like the Mike Pence moment during the debates and everyone wanted to hone in on the fly. It usually means that that person did pretty well <laughs> because that's all that's left. Um, so, I mean, in, in terms of my personal opinion, I think I echo the majority of Americans. I think uh, actually recent polls said 30 percent of Democrats thought that there was fraud in this election um, and that there's just a lot of weird stuff happening. Um, I, you know, I believe in due process. I think it's very strange if you are feeling confident and good and you think that you won the right way. Uh, there is no reason to block audits and to block recounts and to not let people um, do ballot verifications to make sure the signature matches. Um, and I feel very comfortable with Sydney Powell. And this week she is presenting what is apparently supposed to be a very big argument to um, the Georgia courts. Uh, so I'm definitely going to be watching it. And I'm I am of the opinion that this election is far from over and the numbers just don't make sense. You are just not going to be able to convince me that Joe Biden uh, was a more popular president uh, elect uh, than uh, I mean, presidential candidate than Barack Obama. Barack Obama was kinetic when he was running everybody, including myself. I cried, by the way, when Barack Obama won. Uh, you felt that energy on the ground. It was the same thing you felt when you saw Trump in Pennsylvania. Uh, you knew that he had increased his numbers and more people were behind him. And so this whole idea that Joe Biden is the most popular pres president, camp presidential candidate that's ever been in America is just that is in and of itself fraudulent. Mark, let me so, only give you the floor, Mark, because because I co-sign with Candace. So let me give you no, the you floor. Go ahead. Buck. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> yes, I do. Um, so, so a couple of things, right? One, it's interesting the the uh, part of it, we have to look at demographic shifts in voting patterns, right? I mean, I would argue Donald Trump's not more popular than Ronald Reagan, but he certainly got a hell of a lot more votes, right? Um, it, there's a way that as time goes on, more people vote, the voting base gets broader. Uh, there are a few factors here. Um, I agree. I don't think Joe Biden is more popular than Barack Obama. That's why Barack Obama has a much more successful uh, uh, campaign in, in 08 and in 12, but I think simply the, the voting base is different. What I'm seeing with, with, um, with Giuliani is interesting. He's outside of court, not just Giuliani, but the Trump administration outside of court is arguing fraud. Inside of court, they're arguing much more technical and procedural stuff. I agree there's probably fraud in every election. 
Um, I don't think that there's ever been an election in American history where someone didn't vote twice or some dead guy, dead woman didn't vote. Um, but the odds of winning a presidential election by fraud, I think, are infinitesimal. You have a better chance of winning the Powerball while standing in front of a house you won on Publishers Clearinghouse while being struck by lightning than winning the presidency by fraud, right? I mean, 10 people, 100 people, maybe, but but th these big numbers, absolutely. Well, I mean, I think I think, I think 100 people- all over the world. Go, 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 go ahead, Candace. I, was just, I mean, 100 it people happens. definitely- <laughs> It happens it's, all over the world. That's actually, it's actually more likely to happen if we're, if we're looking at, you know, communist regimes and uh, that's why- Huh? I only mean, I'm talking about in the U.S. But why do you only mean the U.S.? It's, it's entirely plausible. If it can be executed in Venezuela, if it can be executed in Russia, it can be executed in Cuba, why can't it be executed in America? Um, in the abstract, sure. But there doesn't seem to be any evidence that, one, our, sec our election security is of the same sort as, say, uh, Venezuela. Um, well, we're using now the same voting systems. That's the whole point. <laughs> it's not just voting systems. It's also other measures. It's double checks. It's it's the it's the audit system. It's the courts. And again, if there's evidence, if there's any, is there any reason to believe right now? And this is an honest question. Is there any reason to believe right now that there is uh, an extraordinary amount of, of 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 fraud? Is there any reason to believe that there's enough election fraud to overturn an election? So when Absolutely. you say any reason, uh, I, I just jump in and say there's what you would call, I, I think there's reasonable suspicion of fraud, right? If we want to use le legal terms, might not be quite yet at the probable cause level if you're going to elevate this in the legal terms and that we haven't yet seen. And this is the big contentious thing. You know, Candace, you saw it too this week. Tucker just brought up about Sidney Powell. Where's your stuff? And more or less, I mean, this is a more complicated discussion. People got very intense about this, but more or less Sidney Powell's response was, I'm, I'm presenting it in court. I'm not here to do this on on a TV show that said. And Candace, let me pass it to you here. She's got to present it in court pretty soon here. Right. I mean, I, I think that's fair. We, we've got there. The clock is running. Right. Absolutely. And and she's already said that Georgia, I mean, whatever they have been teasing, that's going to happen in Georgia this week. I think that will sort of become the barometer uh, to really understand what's going on in this election, because I, I don't think she's a woman that says these things. She's not a Michael Avenetti. She's not doing the rounds, wanting to sit on CNN and Fox News and get attention for herself. She's a serious, well-respected federal prosecutor. Um, and I don't think that she would sink her entire reputation uh, on a big nothing burger, as the left likes to say. Um, and and just kind of going back to what, what Mark was saying before about widespread fraud, like what are the chances in America? I mean, what are the chances in America that this this entire year they have been designing a system um, in America for voting that has never existed before, encouraging mail-in ballots, you know, saying that people should not come out of their houses to vote. I mean, we, we've essentially transformed the entire electoral process um, in one year to accommodate a virus that has an over 98% uh, survival rate. Um, and there's just been weird things. It's, what are the chances that you have a candidate who we've never even seen sell out um, a, uh, you know, a cafeteria? You know, Joe Biden, he, this is a guy that we never even saw, um, you know, sell out one crowd, even when he was running against Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders had more momentum behind him than Joe Biden did. So everything about this just feels fraudulent. You know, you feel like you're in um, a weird movie where you're like they're telling you that this person is was a strong candidate. They're telling you this person had America behind him, but it just doesn't feel right in your gut. Um, now, your gut is not enough, obviously, and you are absolutely correct that Sidney Powell has to present evidence, but of any professional and any person who wants to be well respected will present that evidence in court and not, you know, the court of law, as much as I love Tucker Carlson, is not on Tucker Carlson's show. Mark, can I, can I ask you this? You know, there seems to be uh, a belief. I mean, there, there are a few things, right? There's, there are journalists out there, notably, uh, you know, Jake Tapper at CNN has been one, who raised this you know, you better you better abandon Trump now because this is going to look re really bad for you in the future. And that actually just stokes the fire even more. People get even more like, yeah, we're going to take we're going to take advice from from Jake Tapper about this. How much I mean, speaking speaking from your side, speaking from the Democrat perspective, how much of what we're seeing right now is really is, is rooted in the desire to like poke at Republicans who maybe have some hair dye coming down their face versus to poke at or versus rather the real belief that Donald Trump isn't, you know, that if the court challenges happen and it all gets shot down in the end, that Trump's really not going to leave. Like, is your side really worried he's not going to leave? Because that to me just. But go ahead. I, I think that there's a couple of things. Here. I, I think 
every I've never met anyone on the left um, who even in, cause there are things that people say in public and then we whisper in private, you know, totally get it. Right. Um, there's a whole bunch of us who whisper. Right. The, we know. try to say the honest things on this show, the things that even our right. own side gets mad at us for. Go ahead. Absolutely. I have never heard anyone whisper that they think this election could be remotely fraudulent. Um, and, and I think that the, I think the left genuinely believes and I think we're absolutely correct that this that this is not a, a legitimate challenge. And there's a few reasons why that's the case. Four years ago, Donald Trump lays out a very similar argument. Right. He says the only they're, they're rigging the election. The only way I lose is if um as if they cheat then he beats hillary clinton i would argue honestly handily without a doubt right hillary lost because she lost you know forget russians forget all that hillary lost because she ran a bad campaign um particularly in the in the last lap of the campaign this time around they ask about you know he, he teases and i know you're, you're it's it's a constant right-wing argument right he doesn't really mean it he's just he's just screwing with you guys right but he kept saying you know I'm going to run four more years. Hey, maybe eight, maybe 12, right? Tease. I, I get it. It's a Trump tease. But again, he's, he's, he's signaling that he doesn't believe in a peaceful transfer of power, right? Even if it's a joke, even if it's just the stoke, mm. even if it, even if Come on. The spirit, I, you, you may say, no, that's what he's joking about. Well, he you know, he's, but it's a joke. It's a joke. I feel like libs never take a joke when it comes to Trump. It's so true. I, I, I can take it. I can take a decent again. Put Christmas didn't... music behind him when he puts up these. Oh, I'm going to be four more years, eight more years, twelve more. Years. I mean, no, he's trolling. No, no <laughs> doubt. But imagine if Barack Obama joked about some of the most fundamental dimensions of American democracy, right? But that's not my issue with Trump. Just to be clear, I'm saying there's that. Then the question is, we got closer to the election. Of again, he starts with the if only way I can lose is if is, is if I uh, is, is is if they cheat, right? Do you believe in a peaceful transfer of power? He, the first few times, the first few times he was asked that question, he didn't give a, a clear or straight answer. He eventually did. He absolutely eventually did. But when really pressed on, I, I believe it was Savannah Guthrie, uh, he gave a really good answer. But again, we're, we're looking at three or four times. It shouldn't take that many times to say just yes. This was a this was a very low bar. Just yes, right? But instead of doing that, he says, well, I, 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 of course I'll transfer power if they don't cheat. But the only way, but but it almost seemed in, in his language that the, the measure of them cheating is that he didn't win. He said, I can only lose if they cheat. So if I lost, they cheated. And, and so- Can I just push back on you saying that you accepted the fact that Hillary didn't, won, didn't run a good campaign and that's why Trump beat her. You think Joe Biden ran a good campaign from the parking lot? I think he ran a, at least I'm not that guy campaign. And I think it happened to work. That I was Hillary's campaign too, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, and and I think to be perfectly honest with you, if there were not COVID nineteen, uh, I think D Donald Trump would have won handily. I, I I I don't. It's hard to unseat a, an incumbent president. I think these were unusual historical circumstances. The fact that this many black people voted for Trump, the fact that this many women voted for Trump, the fact that the fact that Trump got the most votes ever of a sitting U.S. president, um, says something, right? It, amidst the pandemic, so I I, I think Biden won. Part, he didn't run a good campaign, but he won. And, and, and for me, that, 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 that's the ultimate you point. Know, and one, one yeah, part, Mark, one part when you bring up the peaceful, and, and I don't, to be fair, you're not somebody who still makes the Russia argument. So I don't, you know, one thing we'll never do is I don't saddle you with things that you don't, you don't say or whatever. But just for the context of this conversation, there's also a very w widespread feeling on the right that there wasn't an acceptance of the 2016 loss. Like you say you accept it, and I believe you, and I take you at your word, and I've never heard you do the Russia, and I know people on the left all over the place who did do the Russia collusion thing at one point. I've never saw you, I never never remember you know, hearing that from you, and certainly you're not saying it now, which is all that really matters for our conversation, but they didn't really accept, right? That's, so the mentality seems to be, we can do this whole Russia thing, and also a special counsel, and investigate people, and grind them down, and I mean, the whole thing was bullshit, like top to bottom. It was just the whole thing was nonsense. Um, but beyond that, now it's like, let's all operate in in good faith. And I do think that there is a substantial sense on the right that, you know what, if the process is annoying to Biden and his voters right now, good. I think that's a widespread sentiment. And, and I think that's it wasn't like it was just Russia. It was hoax after hoax after hoax. Yeah. You know, it's uh, it was start, started with the dossier and oh, you know, Trump is in Russia and, and he's got prostitutes peeing on him. I mean, it was that that absurd, right? Then it was attacking him. Not that anything's wrong with what, that. What he, what he was elected to do. I mean, even I would wrap under that same thing, Brett Kavanaugh. 
I mean, what you put, <laughs> what you put him trying to do what he's supposed to as a president, picking a very strong person, Brett Kavanaugh. Think about what they put Brett Kavanaugh through. Then we have the impeachment hoax, and we're going to impeach him for no reason. And so it, it has actually been a nonstop onslaught. And they have not accepted that President Trump, and they've said it. It's not like we're, we're imagining it. They have outward said this is an illegitimate president. Hillary Clinton has said this is an illegitimate president. CNN has said for the last four years this is an illegitimate president. And now all of a sudden it's, well, you just need to accept the fact that Joe Biden won despite all of these people and their sworn affidavits saying that they witnessed fraud. Just ignore all of that. They had nothing. They didn't even have sworn affidavits. They had nothing. They had a made-up dossier and no person that was willing to stand by it. And we all just had to take it and accept it. So it just doesn't work that way, unfortunately. So, so I think I think there's a little bit of apples and oranges, right? If There's one thing to be a sore loser, right? And it's another thing to be someone who doesn't concede a loss at all, right? Like, I'm not leaving the court, right? So, for example, if Hillary the day after stands she she calls donald trump she concedes she announces him as president she says i i'm here to support the president-elect whatever he needs i've offered my support of course she doesn't mean it nobody ever means that but she said it right there, there's there's a transfer of power and then if you want to complain and moan and whine about russia and collusion and all of that other stuff for the next 50 years you absolutely can al gore did the same thing and i think al gore had an even better argument right but i i think at the very least he, he conceded at a certain point if right. donald if, if Donald Trump, if Donald Trump said to, said, look, I the, the election results are what they are, but there are some places like Georgia, um, maybe Pennsylvania, although, um, yeah, we, we could talk about Pennsylvania in a second. Um, it looks like even if he were to win somehow, right, and even if they were to overturn those ballots and even if they were all for him, which seems to be a logical step he seems to miss, he's like all the ones that don't get counted, they were clearly all not for me. So now I win. Right. Which is not how it works either. But if even if all that were to happen, Donald Trump still wouldn't have the electoral votes to win. Now, if of course, if there was some global conspiracy against him, we'd have to reassess some things. But even if there were an, an, an error, a procedural error, um, that would be something different. But again, I just want to highlight in court, Giuliani, it, none of, they're not arguing fraud. They're arguing fraud at press conferences. They're arguing fraud on Twitter. They're, they're making a very different argument in the courts, and the courts would not hear, uh, of, well, I won't say they wouldn't hear, they would not acknowledge a fraud argument because there's not sufficient evidence of one. So for me, if Trump wants to fight in the court, fight in the court, but don't stop Joe Biden from reading security documents, don't, don't stop pr processes from going on, even if they seem relatively uh, immaterial to some people. They're significant, and they also give, a, a, they give the impression to the American people that um, that, tr that Trump's not letting go. And, he, and yes, he's a victim of his own jokes. He's a victim of his own refusal to just say, I believe in peaceful transfers of power. All of these things make a lot of us genuinely skeptical that he that he's going to let this thing go. Now, I well, have to I, I mean, just so you know, I disagree with you completely. I don't think he should concede because there are 73 million Americans that are Republican and 30 percent of Democrats who believe that there was a high level of fraud in this election. We don't want him to concede. So you're saying, you I mean, talk about comparing apples and oranges. You're, you're comparing Hillary Clinton, who lost by a lot, um, and there was no widespread, you know, people saying, oh, fraud, fraud. There weren't hundreds and hundreds of sworn affidavits, people saying that they, um, it, you know, saw fraud. Or they saw Trump ballots come in cleanly, and there was a big dump of 100,000, over 100,000 Trump ballots at 3 o'clock in the morning. Under those circumstances, I would advise Hillary Clinton not to concede either. She just got her butt whooped, plain and simple. You know what I mean? So she conceded, great, but to say, to, you're comparing apple to orange to say that, well, Trump to just concede and then deal with it after. It's the exact opposite. This is now the time. It is not Inauguration Day, right? Right? It, the election ha has, has completed. He believes there is fraud. You fight that now because if there is fraud and it's going to overturn the results, right, because legally <laughs> uh, President, I mean, former Vice President Joe Biden is not the president-elect, right? We, we do not have a president-elect right now in this country, yeah, right? Really if the second he concedes, we do have a president-elect in this country, and that is Joe Biden. So when Hillary Clinton conceded, Trump became the president-elect, and that is why it was, it was incumbent upon the Obamas to allow him to access for a peaceful transfer of power. We are right now waiting on election results for an ultimate to decide who is the ultimate winner of this election. And you, you do not just you do not just concede because that's what the left, who has demonized you and your supporters for the last four years, thinks that you ought to do. I mean, I stand by him waiting. Mark, can I, I, can I ask I you? Agree that, can, can I just ask Mark? You know, I, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say I agree that if Donald Trump actually believes that he's been defrauded and there's legitimate evidence, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say. I'm not saying. Even though you think you 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 won, concede anyway. Yeah. I don't I don't begin from the premise that he's operating in good faith. I don't believe that he believes um, that. I either think he I believe that he either 
knows he lost or he's not actually capable of accepting any sort of loss given all of the kind of context so, that came uh, into how, it. how much of this is is unique to you know one of the big things that we saw happening during trump's four years was people would say and candace does people would say what he's doing is unprecedented and a lot of journals oh but this is unprecedented and then there was this fun Twitter, you know, echo chamber of people that were like, well, here's five other presidents that basically did this like this would keep happening. And it was effectively there were Trump rules. There were Trump specific. And even if they didn't make any sense, it's like, well, Trump can't do that because he's Trump and orange man bad. Mark, I mean, I'm curious from from your from your perspective, if Mitt Romney, God forbid, but if Mitt Romney had just lost an election and was taking this out to this level in the courts, is the fear really just specific to Trump? Because a lot of us look at this and say, it feels like Trump derangement syndrome is pushing the fear of him not transferring power far beyond what's... I mean, well, Candace no, I, is talking about a timeline here. Everything is still on track. Like, there's no, there's been no refusal to transfer. But go, go ahead. If No, it's a great question. I mean, if, if Mitt Romney... Because it's not... It's not if you if you swap out Mitt Romney for Donald Trump, we have a different out. We have a different feeling about this. If, if Mitch, if Mitt Romney had said those same things and moved in the same ways, I'd have the same skepticism about Mitt Romney. Um, I think that you're right that there's a this is unprecedented thing that happens with every president. And, and it's always one side or the other. I remember when Obama started putting together a transition team in, in June or July uh, before before he was he, he won the election. And in Fox News, went, I was working at Fox News at the time, and they went nuts. So oh, this is unprecedented, the hubris, the arrogance. How dare he do this? No president in U.S. history has ever done this. And then you look back and realize that George H.W. Bush had not only done it, but he had done it um, two months earlier. Um, and uh, George W. Bush had done the same thing. And so there's a way that every side says, oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening. The sky is falling. I, I agree with you on that. I, I think there are a few things, though, that Trump has done that, it that are indeed unprecedented. And I think that's true with every Every I think every president has a thing that they do that no one else does. I think, though, in this case, it's not just that first. First of all, no president has contested the outcome of an election in this way. Right. Second, mm. not in this way. And, and second and second. And I, I'd love to hear your response to that. But um, but but the, but the second thing is that is that, again, Trump leading up to this said the only way that I will lose is if they cheat. And I will and I will accept the peaceful transfer of power as long as they don't cheat. So he's essentially saying I will accept the peaceful transfer of power as long as I don't lose. But that's his sales. I, 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 I want to let Candace in here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Candace. That's good. But that's like Trump sales. He's showing that. He's showing that. He's 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 doing things the right way. He is he is going through the legal process uh, to prove what he believes to be legitimate levels of fraud and what millions and millions of Americans believe to be legitimate levels of fraud. And I'll just say this: there are two things that I perceive to be illegitimate. The first is the media pretending that Joe Biden is the president elect. That is setting us up for a civil war if these if these election results in these states are overturned it's setting us up for a civil war because you've deluded people into believing that they won an election and it's wrong um and and so the media has been incredibly irresponsible the second thing I believe to be illegitimate is this idea that the left is really fearful that Trump's going to have to be dragged out if we go through the process and it's determined that, no, you know what, there wasn't any fraud, but they think Trump is just going to, what, sit in that White House with tons of guns and say, I'm going out, um, you know. Yeah, I mean, Barack know, actually made a joke this week no, about sending in, like Barack made they a joke just, about sending in the SEALs to take Trump out of the White House. I mean, yeah, I, mean I know he was so kidding, crazy. but like. You know, it's a it's, it's more theatrical. I mean, at the end of the day, what they're trying to do is create a pressure campaign for Trump to concede. Trump is not going to concede. Tre and Trump does not move when it comes to a pressure campaign. And his supporters are proud of that. They're happy about that. they're rallying around him all across the country. So we just have to let this play out and stop being theatrical. But it is impossible for the left not to be theatrical. So it's like we spent <laughs> four years building up this idea that he's literally Hitler. He's colluding with Russia, all this stuff. So now they're going to pretend that they think he's going out Al Pacino style. And it's foolish and it's nonsense and we really shouldn't can, give any more error. So let me, let me ask you a question. Under what circumstances, what, under, two questions. One, do you think if, if the courts, if he's defeated in the courts and he's been, he's been beaten pretty handily, I mean, I think he's won one out of like, as of like Thursday, one out of like maybe 25, 26 challenges. But if the courts all say no, and he and, and he can't win through the courts. Does he concede? I know he'll leave. You're saying he'll leave the White House, but does he concede? Does he say I lost? Does he, First and foremost, say one of 25 is disingenuous because everyone is pretending that Arizona, um, all of these lawsuits that are being filed are not being filed by actually Trump's campaign. Um, and secondly, he fully expected to lose in the lower courts. The lower courts are left leaning. So if you're talking about, you know, he's he lost in in, in the lower courts that had, you know. Uh, majority of 70% of Democrats, he's fully expected 
asking that and what he wants. The ideal situation is for this to go to the Supreme Court um, and, and to have people that are constitutionalists look at this from a constitutional perspective. Um, that's clearly what he wants. Um, and yes, if he loses and they look at the evidence and the evidence is presented, Donald J. Trump will walk out of the White House and he will will peacefully transfer power over to Joe Biden. Everybody knows that. Anybody else is just being theatrical. No, no, no. I, I, I'm not asking if, I, I'm not saying, I'm, forget the Al Pacino exit scene, although that'd be really interesting, right? You know, you want to play rough! But I, I, I'm, I'm thinking more, does he actually, does he does he give an actual concession speech or does he just walk out? Like, do you, do you will you see the traditional humble sort of, I congratulate Joe Biden on, he won the election, I acknowledge that he beat It's not going to be his finest, it's not going to be like his greatest oratory ever, but yeah, I mean, I think, Mark and I have kind of a side bet even on this one, Candace, where, I, where I've been saying, you know, maybe he has to buy me like, you know, a, a round of sake while I'm going bankrupt, paying for all of his Toro but uh, I, I do think that the president will give some formal, you know, this is democracy. This is what happens. But, you know, look, the Trump's personality is, is what it is. And he's not about to be a guy. He doesn't like everyone who knows him across the board. People have turned on him. People still like him. They'll say he does not like losing. So that's that I don't think is going to change. But I think he'll go through the process. Mark, can I ask just um, a because, I, I, you know, we're, we've got a lot of things I want to get to. And we're already you know going going pretty deep into this one. We're not obviously going to come to resolution right now. Give Candace, if you would, your uh, assessment that you and I talked about a couple weeks back of why Trump did well um, with black and Latino voters relative to the GOP. And then I, I want to let Candace respond with either what she agrees with, disagrees with it and so on. But, Mark, why don't you I'll give you first crack. So I think there's a couple things going on here. One, I think the Democratic uh, Party just has never. Uh, we, we, black people are a captured electorate, as political scientists say. We ain't going nowhere. They know we're voting Democrat, and so they don't appeal to us. And so a slice of people are never going to be satisfied with that. Sometimes that slice is going to be 7%, but that slice can get to 12 or 15 if the person is compelling enough, or if the Democrat isn't compelling enough. Um, and so this is what you're seeing. I think with black men, though, that number went up a lot this election. I mean, in some cities it was at 20%. Overall, you're looking at 16 18% for black men. And I think part of it is... Uh, I think there's a few factors here, but part of it is that there are there are men whose idea of what freedom looks like, whose idea of what uh, liberty looks like, whose idea of, of what possibility looks like is Donald Trump. And I think that's really problematic. But I think a lot of times that's the vision that we have. And so um, what, rather than voting for for the community or voting for policies that might benefit us now. And I see poor people do this all the time. They'll vote for they'll vote against the they'll vote for the against the death tax. They'll vote uh, for they'll vote against tax hikes. For people who make more than four hundred thousand, when they're making like eight bucks an hour, um, and I watch this happen because of how they buy into a certain kind of logic, and I find that it's happening more and more, and 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 I think I think that is fundamentally the problem. I think there were people who didn't vote for Hillary Clinton because she was a woman. There's no doubt about that, but I think there were a lot of people who simply didn't feel like she was speaking to them, and and they didn't do a good job talking to them. I don't think Joe Biden has necessarily done a great job talking to folk. But so, so I think all those factors are, are playing in. Unless they were paying Hillary two hundred fifty thousand dollars an hour, she was not speaking to them. But I'll let, uh, I'll, let I'll let Candace pick up on Candace. Why do you think Trump did so well with black and uh, brown voters this time around? Um, well, first off, Mark, those economic arguments were pretty shaky. There, uh, people, if you're saying a poor person is voting. Uh, for rich people to have tax cuts, that probably is exemplary of a poor person that has a, a better economic understanding of how things work. When you give tax cuts to the rich, it doesn't mean that the poor have more taxes. It means they actually have less because rich people are less inclined to tie up their money. And I'm not saying that as a feeling. That's just a fact if you look at the history of America. Um, so that's just some weird um, Democrat fantasy that somehow giving when the rich people pay less, the poor people suffer. It's exactly the exact opposite. Um, but to answer the question about why um, black Americans surround a Trump, I mean, I've been saying for the last four years there we are heading towards a Blexit. And I saw it coming from a mile away. The Democrats no longer have a winning message. I don't, that, not that they ever had one, but black Americans, there is a fatigue setting in with the victim narrative. Uh, black, the, the only appeal that Democrats make to black people is you are black. And if you don't vote for me, it's, it's all fear tactics. Racism is going to come back. You're going to be black. You're going to be back on slave ships. You're going to be back in Africa um, telling people to vote according to their complexion and not their, their brain cells. Um, and it's a losing argument. People are tired of being told they have to see themselves as a victim because they're black. Trump came up with the exact opposite. Trump said, I don't see black. I don't see white. I like green. I like money. I like success. I like winning. That's a winning argument. There's, and the, the, I said a thousand times, as soon as you're in the room with Trump, there is something about him 
Uh, there is an energy, there is a spirit. You feel like you're, you're suddenly triumphant. You realize that you are an American first, right? You're not black, you're not just black. You're not separate from the American dream. You're a part of it. Um, and and I, I predicted it. I knew it was going to happen um, in terms of why, uh, you know, he, even though he did double his support amongst black women, which is actually incredible. Um, that was you know, stunning to me. I still don't understand. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's just black people are tired of it. Black lives matter. This it's just it's like the argument is you can feel like a loser or you can feel like a winner. Democrats are going to have to switch this up. I, I've been saying it. Everyone laughed. When I kept saying Trump was going to get more of the black vote and it happened. And I'm telling you, it's not going to stop at Trump because this Trumpism is going to go beyond Trump. Right. And, and more and more black Americans are waking up because we're sharing this message with one another. People, organizations like my own um, in terms of why it's slower among the black women. I talked about this a lot in my book. Um, you know, the black woman is the ultimate victim of a Democrat machine in terms of, um, you know, uh, the welfare industry that was implemented in the 1960s under LBJ. It was all about making the black woman feel um, that the government had to take care of her. So when you come around and you say that you're going to take away benefits or you're going to, you know, the government is not going to help you, you know, that that shakes the foundation um, for the group of people in America that benefit the most from welfare benefits. Um, so I think that that's part of it, you know, because the government replaced black men in many ways um, in the 1960s, which is which is sad and something that I, you know, I argue against. And so um, this is not going to go away. This is something that the Democrats should be very nervous about. I've been saying it for four years. Um, black people are turning back to the Republican Party and stepping back inside of the American dream, plain and simple. Mark, I want to I want to ask you about uh, both of you about, about BLM uh, in a moment. But first, let's uh, have you let, let you respond, if you would, to what Candace just said. Oh, wait, I do want to add about also you spoke about the Cuban-Americans. Um, that was a no brainer. I love AOC. I might be her biggest fan now because uh, she did that because she is just so deluded. Uh, socialism, socialism, socialism. <laughs> Latinos know what socialism is. You are not going to roll up into the Latino community talking about socialism. We're going to bring socialism to America. Well, socialism Cubans. is going to be great. Yeah. Democratic socialism. I mean, it just shows that she is, you're from the Bronx and you are out of touch with your people. I mean, I, when I saw I was like, Hispanic vote, done. Forget it. The Cubans, the Venezuelans, they know what that means. Like you can, that, that is not like it happened 60 years ago. It's uh, it's happening now in Venezuela. Uh, Elian Gonzalez, I was a kid when these people were swimming over, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Trying to get away from Fidel Castro. Uh, so it was foolish, and it, but it was incredible because it showed that the rhetoric again is failing right so where did they vote the most for trump latinos on the border right in texas so for all of this trump is a xenophobe and building the wall is bad and all this stuff they know what it is because even when they were attacking um border police when they were saying this was a racist thing for people who actually know the CBP and who have been down there and spoken to them, they're 80 percent Latino. You were talking about taking out the jobs of Latino men, the people that work for ICE. When you were launching these attacks against ICE and our Border Patrol, you were attacking Latinos. Well, that, so the Democrats were just completely blind to what they were doing. So that was excellent to watch. Candace pull, t touches on an issue, Mark. I think it's fascinating. There was an analysis, believe it or not, on NBC News, which I think the website there rarely has op-eds that I care to read. But it was about looking at I mean, we talk about black and brown uh, communities, right? That that's a, a term that we'll use all the time in politics. But when you actually look into this and this is what the Cuban issue obviously raises. But there's other variations of this, too, with legal Latino immigrants, for example, and legal Latino immigrants from uh, from, you know, countries like Venezuela, for example, feel very differently about immigration related issues and Trump than in then than people that have, say, an illegal in their family who came over from Mexico. Right. That effectively, there are so many different layers and actually even rivalries and, and histories among black and brown groups in this country that affects the way they view politics. It seems like the Democrat approach at some level to treat it like that the, the, the terms are so broad that they almost they, they, they lack a, they, they can lack a clarity and even a political utility sometimes. I don't, I don't I don't think that that's particular Democrats. I, I think that that minority communities in general in the United or minoritized communities in the United States in general get uh, sort of ignored or or um, flattened out those nuances and differences. And I, and, I th and again, I, I think that the Democratic Party certainly paid a price for it uh, in the last two elections, uh, more, more especially in 2016. Uh, but but I think it's an interesting thing to think about. I think that when AOC and, and, and it's not that AOC is going down in Florida and saying we're going to turn America into a socialist paradise. 
But AOC absolutely is, you know, comes out of a tradition, as many people do, of DSA, of Democratic Socialists of America. Uh, and Democratic Socialism, which is what Bernie Sanders represented, which is what many people represented, is not, uh, is, is not the, the Cuban Revolution. It's not uh, Fidel. It's, it's not Che Guevara. It's, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it, it's 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 absolutely not. And, and it I, absolutely is. It, putting the word democratic in front of socialism just means we're going to let you vote it in, right? <laughs> That's the whole thing. These countries did not. These people they voted him. Fidel Castro talked about democratic socialism, right? I mean, yeah. and people trying to separate it by saying it's going to be different. It's not different. There's there's no different brand of socialism. So, it is well, social. That, that's, so. A couple of points here. If if you're arguing that you think that the end game could be the same, that's certainly an opinion that one could have. Uh, but, but, to argue, but, but, but hear me out. But 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 to argue that there's no actual fundamental, there's no fundamental ideological differences between democratic socialists and say Leninists or Stalinists, or to say that uh, the approach that that Fidel took in '59 is the same that he's taking in 2020, it's simply not true. In fact, if you go to the Democratic Socialists of America website, they'll explain the distinctions they make between them and others. Now, you may you may you may find them unpersuasive, and you may say it. it Hugo Chavez was there's pictures of Hugo Chavez walking with Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders supported him for a reason. It's his brand of socialism. It, what you're talking about is the, what it becomes after the final product, you know, after it's been implemented. Here's what no, has what, now, here's what happened for them what, to what, guarantee what, power. And then it becomes a dictator. But you're talking about the difference between suicide and homicide, right? Uh, I'm, you know, I'm not. Democrat, Democrat, I'm, I'm, I'm not. You can vote it in. But you're going to end up with with the end result, which is just plain old, which is just plain okay, so, old so homicidal so, socialism. So there's two different conversations happening then, right? You're, you're saying that no matter what they say it is, it's going to end up being something else, right? And no, you're it is exactly as it started with Fidel Castro. They loved him. They cheered it on. It sounded great. Same thing with Hugo Chavez. They loved him. They cheered him on. It sounded great. Bernie Sanders, AOC, they're all selling. You look at their rhetoric. It's the exact same thing they're selling. Okay? Well, no, just to be clear, Fidel didn't. Uh, Fulgencia Batista wasn't wasn't beaten in a general election. He it, there was an, there was a violent overthrow. Um, Bernie Sanders, to my knowledge, has never picked up anything but a minivan key. So so these are they didn't they didn't in, they didn't enter. Uh, their their particular visions uh, uh, in the same manner or in the same way, right? It, even both strategically or as a practical matter. But 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 I'm saying something different. What I'm saying is that the 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 idea of of democratic socialism, which is which is which is about for many of us workers' rights. It's about it's about elections, but it's about workers' rights. It's about it's about living wages. These are arguments that probably could be um, persuasive to many American people. Um, but I, I think you're right. I think that the, the I, I think you're right on this particular point, you and Buck, that um, implicitly anyway, is, is that the Cubans the and Venezuelans language. don't like it. Well, yeah, but and, and, and because it conjures very particular things for them. Because they said that they called it workers rights. They said it was a, this is exactly the same rhetoric and that it, it terrifies them because it's in their memory. It's not they're not they're not confused. I'm not disagreeing with that point. What I'm saying is because they're finding similarities and because people came in promising those things doesn't necessarily mean that the outcome is going to be those things. There are, I mean, the Taliban promised workers' rights, but I wouldn't argue that Bernie Sanders... Yeah, I mean, the Soviet Union also guaranteed a lot of people stuff in their constitution and obviously didn't, right. didn't happen. So, so lots of people promise it, and it, pl it plays out different ways in different contexts. Yeah. But ultimately, what I'm saying is, yeah, I, I, I think that that certainly... That there, it, and this was part of the Democratic sort of post... sort of autopsy, right, was... Um, or post-election autopsy was to say... Uh, some of the more conservative middle of the road Democrats were arguing, hey, you know, because we didn't distance ourselves from this narrative, because we didn't distance ourselves from BLM, because we didn't distance ourselves from um, from defunding. And you lost now. House seats and probably didn't take control of the Senate, although I know that's not yet not yet determined. And, and I, by the way, Mark, I, I think that's a fair I think that's a fair assessment. And it also is a perfect way to transition into BLM. It's not a question I've had a chance to a uh, ask you yet. Um you know, I, I so I, I live here in New York City and I had what I call the purge night happen on my block and there were broken store windows. I mean, I say on my block, I mean, across the street from where I, I'm walking my dog every day. I mean, it was just it was mayhem on the streets here for a night. Right. A lot of cities yeah. across the country went through some version of that. But to see it in midtown Manhattan and to see it on Fifth Avenue, and all these stores. And now I saw a lot of the kids. I also saw a lot of the mug shots um, when, you know, of, of the ones that were arrested afterwards, primarily White kids, um, white liberals. I mean, we would say white Bernie Sanders. I mean, I'm sorry. I blame I, the fathers. I blame the parents. Um, well, I, the fathers in the house. <laughs> mostly, mostly, mostly Biden. They're Biden voters, though. I mean, these, these are Democrats. They're, they're leftists and of one kind or another. And so what I want to ask you is this, and I really mean this earnestly, and obviously I'm going to be curious to hear Candace, Candace's sense of this, too. I mean, my contention after seeing 
uh, this now for a second time, the BLM movement come up and, and go through different iterations of what what, you know, cases they bring up and everything else is that it makes. And I know this is a little harsh, but I, I'm just going to say it because I say it all the time on radio. BLM as a political movement makes everything worse for everyone. It's actually just made everything worse. It makes it makes it harder to get bipartisan uh, criminal justice reform for which the Trump administration, as well as other conservatives and Republicans have interest in. It makes minority communities less safe. It makes all communities less safe. It takes issue. Anyway, I, I don't want to go on some super long rant. That's not fair. We're in a conversation, not a monologue here. But but my contention, my contention is that BLM, based on what has happened, right, not on the theories and, and, and the realities of injustice, based on what it has done, it's made everything worse for everyone. What do you think? Um, it's funny. And by the way, I, I, I'm really bad at selling things. I had a book come out two weeks ago that I never mentioned even. On the oh, show. let's see. It. It, it's called We Still Here, oh. Pandemic, Policing, Protests and Possibilities. There's there are two chapters that get into this very thing, which made me think about it. So, by the way, everybody you should buy this book. You know, why isn't it say we're still here? Why isn't it proper English? <laughs> that, that really bothers me. We still here. I am shocked that you would say that. Absolutely <laughs> stunned. <laughs> um, um there, there's a few reasons but uh uh of course there's the langston hughes poem um uh st you know um but there's also uh it's, it's meant to invoke black colloquial language um but but there's an interesting question right around blm i think one is that the way people describe the black lives matter movement uh particularly in corporate media is they only they act as if blm is only happening when you see people on the streets breaking a window or marching for a, a dead black person. Mm -hmm. When I think that that's an unfair representation of what, we, what the movement for black lives, BLM mm -hmm. and the movement for black lives more broadly has been doing. So I'll give you an example. Um, in 2014, uh, Mike Brown is killed. And that's when you begin to hear black lives matter first, right? That's when you first begin to hear it, right? Um, then that sort of dies down a bit after uh, he, Darren Wilson wasn't indicted that November. Um, <clears throat> But B BLM didn't just wait until Freddie Gray got killed in Baltimore four months later to do stuff. They were taking over city councils. Um, I'm talking about by taking over, I mean like running for them. They were um, they were pushing policy. They put they put forth a very big policy brief. Um, there's been local organizing around food justice, around uh, violence interruption. I mean, it's one of the interesting things that we see here in Philadelphia. Um, is and, and in Chicago is another great example is conflict resolution and violence interruption as part of the Black Lives Matter conversation. There's the transnational question around Israel Palestine. There's the question around um, there there are questions around school equity, and so Black Lives Matter is not a sort of ambulance chasing protest movement, but rather a sustained thing. So so part of what, when when people say well Black Lives Matter or you say Black Lives Matter hasn't done good for folk, I think you're you're res you're responding to a very particular slice of what the movement is, but just to deal with that slice for a minute, which is the protests and, and the sort of spectacles that, uh, what I call in my book, the spectacle of violence that I think we see um, across the board, I think to assume that we'd be having these conversations without BLM is to deny history. Because the idea is, oh, everybody would love to do police reform if not for these pro crazy protesters in the streets breaking shit, right? But the truth is, the conversations about police reform only happened when there were protesters in the street breaking shit. So uh, let, let me kick. I, I've got a very specific question I want to follow, but let me let me pass to Kansas, uh, Candace, Candace, uh, what do you think? I would disagree. with Buck. No, I would disagree with Buck on his assessment that it's not good for anybody. I think it's great for the Republican Party and I think it's great for conservatives. Um, they are missing the mark on the Black Lives Matter stuff. Democrats are being delusional about it in the same way that they were delusional about dropping the word socialism over and over again. Um, it's waking up, you know, those moderate Dems are coming over to the right and realizing it, Black Lives Matter is what led to the defund the police movement. Um, so they think they're winning with these policies uh, and they're not, you know, <laughs> they're ignoring the polls. They're ignoring that people no longer perceive Black Lives Matter to be favorable. And at the same time, they're scratching their head, asking the question, well, I don't understand why so many people are leaving, you know, are, 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 are turning to the left or are, are, are turning to the right rather. Um, I don't understand why black people are turning to, to, to the right or why people, black people are supporting Trump. Because his message is law and order. You're burning down black neighborhoods, right? You're talking about defund the police while you guys have private security and don't touch your own door handle, right? You defund the police. What happens? We see what happens. The percentage of homicide goes up in black neighborhoods. So I say 
let them keep with their, you know, their delusion. Let them say, stay in that space where they think Black Lives Matter is a powerful message that everybody supports. And in the end, we win on it. I love Black Lives Matter. It's good. It's good for Blexit. It's good for Black conservatives um, because it's so easy to come in and counter that narrative and be pro-police. So. One is um, just just to be fair to what I said, I said it's made things and by that I, I meant the results. Right. But to your point about the political benefits. Yeah, I think those are very real for Republicans. <laughs> but I mean, I, I was referring more to I mean, again, New York is one of the starkest examples of this right now. Shootings are up. I mean, I don't want to oh, give yeah. a specific number, but I mean, the shootings are going through the roof in a place where like we, we've been seeing percent. Right. It's, it's, it's crazy. But so yeah. so here, here's here's a question I have for Mark, because, you know, it's interesting. You, you raise and I see this a lot with with you know with activists the professional activist class and i think by the way i think saul Alinsky is a genius i think he's an evil genius but i think he's a very he's someone you really can't understand modern american politics without knowing rules for radicals and without understanding organizing and street level organizing and and your point about getting attention for an issue that is uh i i want to dig into that for a second because you know you you talk about um mike brown in in uh, ferguson missouri Mike Brown, there was an initial narrative, and then the initial narrative was, as you know, contradicted by the very lengthy investigation by Eric Holder and by the Obama Justice Department and a number of black eyewitnesses who said that, no, he attacked this officer. He got shot. Why? And just so I don't again. No, no, no. To, he, he never attacked the officer. There's no they, they, no, no one. Argued, he charged, the, 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 the official report said that he charged that he charged the officer. I mean, that's what the he, DOJ report. He's walking, OK, attack, he, he, he never got close enough to, to touch Darren Wilson. He was walking. Well, I mean, you chart. Oh, I'm just look, I, we, we can disagree about the specifics of I mean, my recollection of the report yeah. reading it, whatever it was, five years ago or something yeah. was that he that the eyewitnesses claim that he charged him or was perhaps he was about to charge him. I, I, Let's put it this way. He wasn't running away. He, he was, he was not right. The ha hands up did not happen, right? The hands yeah, up, don't shoot thing did not right. happen. So it's just important. There's a large distinction between saying he was walking. I mean, Darren Wilson's own testimony that he was walking toward him, which is a whole different thing than he attacked me. Well, it's a whole different thing than hands up, don't shoot. Right. I mean, that's, that's really. So, so, but so, so here's, so this, so this is interesting, but, but it, it actually still works with what I'm saying because yeah. That became the focus. And there are all these other instances, you know, like these guys, a couple of guys in Philadelphia recently. Well, Mark, I think is really going chapter and verse. He's going to dig, in, dig into it. Um, but yeah, I, I wrote a book about it. So I was just looking at oh, okay. <laughs> it's like, yeah, like, wow, yeah. we're, we're going for it. But no, Mark, but yeah. I, I'm really I've never had anyone answer this question from the left for me. And so yeah. I'm fascinated to, to get an answer from you. Um, you know, you see these cases in Philadelphia where these guys come out. And they're brandishing a knife. And like I worked with the NYPD. I had firearms training and did all kinds of stuff when I was in the CIA. If someone comes at you with a knife like these, you're going to get shot straight. Like there's no you're going to get shot. It's on video. We've all seen it. They those issues get seized on by BLM. But I mean, I remember yes, sure. I remember Officer Michael Slager doing something I mean, to me. And I, I mean, I've written about this when I think the police actually have used excessive force or, or executed somebody. I mean, Walter Scott in Charleston, South Carolina, that looked like a straight up execution to me. And yeah. his name is very far. Like that's police brutality that I think all people of goodwill who understand law enforcement and understand the law look at and say, OK, we, we can have a conversation. Why do we focus on uh, why do they why does BLM focus on the cases where people yeah. who have a background and understand and are being fair minded say this was I, I hate to use the term, but it's a justified shooting. Why do they pick justified shootings I, sometimes? I, I, I think we could. And, and again, there are different cases. Right. So Mike Brown, I would argue. And let's use Mike Brown and Walter Walter Wallace, because I think those are really good. Examples. Walter Scott, I think, is, is that. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Walter Wallace, a different different Walter case, Wallace. different case. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Walter Wallace Jr. in Philadelphia. Right, Walter right, Scott. right. Um, all Carolina. these cases covered in my last book, nobody. Um, the, uh, the the idea is that, uh, and I come out of the tradition of abolition. I'm an abolitionist, and 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 so I want to abolish prisons. I want to abolish police, and that's a long term vision. It's a long term goal. It doesn't mean open all the prison cells tomorrow. It doesn't mean fire all the police departments tomorrow. Part of what I tr want people to do, and part of what BLM wants people to do is not just think about the short-term thing. So in the case of Michael Slager, it's a great example, right? That's an easy one. A guy's running away and you shoot him in the back. That's and he an got charged one. with murder, right? Yeah, and, and the first trial didn't go right, and then the second trial did. So, but but that's an easy one, right? Uh, George Floyd, 
another one, right? Most people look at the George Floyd video and say that should not have happened, right? Regardless of what you think about George Floyd, regardless of what you think about the, just the, the, him being, the way he was killed for eight, you know, over an eight minute and 46 second time, people can agree on. But I think for every George Floyd that police encounter, and I think you two would agree with this, for every George Floyd that police officers encounter, they encounter a whole lot of Walter Wallace's, right? Um, and the question is, to me, short-sighted if we only focus on what the officer could have done in the moment. So when I say defund, I, I'll tell you exactly what I mean by that. When I say defund, it's part of why I want to defund the police is so that the police officer is not in a situation where someone's running at him with a knife. So that so that so that uh, Darren Wilson's not in a situation where he's stopping. He didn't stop Mike Brown for stealing out of the store. Remember, he stopped him for jaywalking. There's no reason why a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri, should be stopping someone for 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 jaywalking, except that the town doesn't have any money and they make their money by giving everybody tickets. Eighty percent of the town has warrants, right? Literally, as of 2013. So the the police officers are now tax collectors, right? And in this case, you know, you got a guy who's having serious mental health issues, and the only person his mom could call was an armed police force, right? She called three times that day before before the, the, the death sequence started. She, this time she called for an ambulance. She didn't call for police help. She called for an ambulance to 302 him. The problem is the way our system currently works, police are taking all the, are picking up all those calls, right? Yeah, and but, so, but the ambulance I, is not going to show up without police, as you know, because those people I, I, are scared. The, 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 that's my point, right? And so... The question for me isn't should the police officer have talked to him more or used a taser or used mace or had a battering ram or been warmer and fuzzier. Those are questions we can have. And I, and I, th I do think there's some questions. And I've talked to many police officers who said, yeah, you know, it depends on the officer. Right. We're kind of trained to shoot and kill here. I would have done something different. But that's not what our training suggests. I get that. My point is we have to imagine the social world in a way so that the, the mom has someone to call other than the police force so that there are institutions that can help that man before he gets a knife in his hand so that the police officer isn't put in the position of getting stabbed or shooting somebody. But it feels like the, that's movement that's, the movement that's trying to raise this is resulting in the immediate term right now in more people, particularly uh, more young African-Americans being shot in high crime neighborhoods. So that I mean, that's still a contention that, that I have and that I, I have concerns about. But Candace, let me hand it to you because I know. I just want to say for the record, if I call the call the police and there is a male that is yielding a wielding a knife towards me, I want that man shot and killed. Um, I do not. I am not looking for an abolishment of police. I do not want the ambulance to show up. I don't want you to try to mace him. I want that man to be shot and killed. Um, and we are increasingly seeing the Black Lives Matter narrative is becoming a joke because uh, this can't just be said anymore. Um, and by the way, and, and let's go back to George Floyd for a second. The, what Black Lives Matter does is they train you to believe that this is happening because a person is black. Yeah, there is nothing in that tape to suggest that this happened because George Floyd was black. He was not called the N-word. He didn't say, listen to me, you black guy. Um, in fact, when they finally leaked, they didn't release it, but when they leaked accidentally um, the full tape, you see that he is, you know, obviously high on something. He's on drugs. They keep asking why he's acting weird. Um, he asks to be put on the ground, uh, which is extraordinary that nobody's talking about. But we didn't see that. We only saw the nine minutes that he was on the ground. And I'm not saying it justifies the police's excessive use of force. But I am saying that this case, when it was sensationalized, was absent a lot of facts leading up to it. This is a man that's on drugs. Um, you know, as someone, me, who when, when I used to live in a neighborhood where there were crackheads and people that are on drugs, they are the scariest people in the entire world. Um, I want to be able to call the police and I want police to be able, um, you know, to to use excessive force against individuals that would use excessive force well, against excessive you know, force or appropriate force. Just I, just so you don't get trouble later. I think she Why meant lethal think... force. I think she meant lethal force, not excessive. Yeah, force. That's, that's I'm I'm just because yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't I don't want oh, you to say. Le okay. She means lethal force. Yeah, 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 to, yeah be able to, be, to, be, to be able to use lethal force when it is necessary. Um, and and so this idea that they should be, you know, the Rashard Brooks case in Atlanta. He takes down two police officers. They were being nothing but nice to him. They grab his taser, and people are still arguing, saying this is an example of racial injustice. No, this is an example of the fact that we need to start taking accountability for the fact that we have criminals. When people are upset with me because I didn't jump on a platform. You don't see yourself when you see these black men. You don't see yourself. No, 
I don't commit crimes. I don't grab, I, I don't grab a taser from a police officer. I don't assault police officers. Stop telling black people, this is again, a losing message for Democrats, that we need to see ourselves in one another. I have more in common with white people, Chinese people, black people that are law abiding citizens, regardless of their race, who would never even be in these circumstances. And again, this is what is leading to people that are, are being turned off by the Black Lives Matter narrative because they racialize it no matter what, even if there's no evidence of race and they want to build some utopian society where who gets hurt at the end of the day under this Black Lives Matter stuff? Always black women. It is black women that are calling the police. It is black women that are under duress. It is like, uh, who was who the guy, um, the recent one? Was it Walter? Uh, what was, who was the guy that... Uh, digitally raped a woman and they turned him into a hero and the and the NFL put his name on a freaking helmet he digitally raped the woman broke into her home digitally raped her this woman calls the police and they still turned him into a hero so this is not even about black lives this is about black criminals now and and people are not going to stand by that it's a, it's a losing message i'm not a criminal i happen to be black stop telling me i have to vibe with this message I think for me, it's a couple of things just in response to that. First, with the Walter Walter Wallace thing, again, this was the woman's son. She wasn't calling on Again, if, if if someone calls and attacks me with a knife, what I want is is to be safe. I want the police to stop the threat. I don't want the person killed. I don't want the person um, executed. I, I simply want them to, I want to be safe. And I think that's what we have a right to ask for. Police want to be safe too, though, when you're yielding a knife to a police officer. I'm, I'm with you. So remember, my, my premise is that we have to, there, there, there are institutions in society that we can create to reduce the chances of that happening. That woman didn't want the police to shoot them. I mean, you're saying you might want that and, and you might, right? But again, you're so- You have to listen to police. That, we already have that in place. If any of these men had listened to police police instructions, they'd all be alive. That is the wonderful, and now you somehow think, well, if the ambulance gets there, they're gonna be better equipped. No, they're not. People that break the law, break the law. Okay, Candace, that's not, that's not my argument. My, my argument, if, if you hear me out again, is that if we can, with regard to Walter Wallace, the argument is that this man had severe mental health needs that had gone unmet for, for many years by society. His ability to follow police commands, his ability to respond or to drop the knife. Nobody walks, a, nobody walks up on people with guns with a knife and thinks they're going to survive when they're in their right mind. Clearly, he, he, was, he was under mental duress. And so what I'm saying is we need to create institutions uh, and mechanisms to support that person before they get into so, this situation. Mark, you're, what you're talking about is, is a, a sort of a, a transformation. I think that's a fair thing to say. Of certain yeah, that's aspects, what defunding certain, is, though. Certain, that's what de no, that's I, what I, I, I know. Are. I'm just I'm trying to yeah. paraphrase. Or, I mean, you're talking about a transformation of some aspects of society. In again, in, in the immediate term, it feels like there is a one. There is a demonization of police. And I can tell you that this was a, an issue that a couple of times Van Jones and I very heatedly debated back in the day at CNN, where I would go to these rallies. I'd go. I mean, I, you know, to cover them for news. I wasn't a participant, but I would see these rallies and they would chant. Everyone knows about the pigs fry them like bacon thing, but there were but there was standard stuff like you know get rid of these killer cops. I mean the I, I have photos of it, and people always challenge me, and then I'm like okay, and I'll just start showing all the photos of police murderers and police are the bad guys. It's like when you when, when when the moment that a police officer feels like he or she is at risk of either going to going to prison for doing their job or not going home at night because they try to do their job, that perception unfortunately hurts high crime areas, which unfortunately in major cities are minority, uh, you know, minority majority areas uh, by and large more than anybody else. So it feels like you're talking about transforming society, but in the short term, what we have are more people, particularly more young black men in America getting shot, getting attacked, and also more little old ladies getting robbed on the way to, you know, the grocery store because BLM is demonizing cops which means that now you have what's called the Ferguson effect or the idea that police are doing much less. And there's data for this, right? I mean, the stuff that you're talking about sounds good, but the, uh, the data doesn't make it look good. You know what I'm saying? What, what data? About the shootings, about the, about the violence, about the huge spike in... I mean, you look at... I think, in, I think it's 47 of 50 U.S. cities have seen year over year at least a double-digit increase in violent crime. Well, it's like 47 on the top. They're the example. They actually voted to defund the police. And what ended up happening? Police officers then stepped down. Police officers said they're not going to do their job. And now what are they doing? They're putting up money to refund the police. And they're having people come in from out of Minneapolis, police officers from out of Minneapolis to help police. It's because it's, it's how, 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 So there, there's, a, I, I, there's a few things there. One, I, I don't think inflate 
the rise in homicide rates with this particular issue at a moment where there's a global pandemic, there's an economic collapse. There's, mm-hmm. there's absolutely no data to suggest that the BLM narrative has caused homicides to go up. There's not a study it's in the world. the police with a piece of the BLM narrative. You just, you, you've admitted that, that you're, you're, you're a supporter of that. Minneapolis is, is a case example where you can look at exactly what happened when their, when their city council voted to defund the police. Now they are trying to get police officers back because it was a terrible mistake. I mean, it's common sense and everyone wants to blame a pandemic. And, and that's the thing is that at least when you guys implement what you want to do and it goes wrong, have the courage to say, you know what, we got it wrong and, and start saving lives. Again, I, I can tell you the, the data, you can, you can have an opinion on this, but the data doesn't bear that out. It does. It does. The data does show that. You're just now you're just trying to piecemeal it. Mark, what data are you what data are you pointing to, Mark? What I'm saying is that there is no available data yet. It's too early to have any data on this. The, the, so you're blaming the data on a pandemic. You're just saying, well, yes, there is higher homicide in all these cities. I'm blaming it on a pandemic. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm you saying is, that. is that there. No, what I'm saying is that there are multiple factors that could be it, and we don't have the data to know which one it is. I'm not saying I'm not saying it is the pandemic. I'm saying that you can't simply say that. Um, that would be like me saying that ever since Donald Trump has been talking about fraudulent elections there's been violence in the streets and therefore Donald Trump and, and then drawing a correlation. It wouldn't be accurate. It would be like me saying ever since the NBA bubble started in, in June, there's been violence in the streets. Clearly people want them to play in arenas, right? These are called illusory correlations. There's, there's a way that just, there, there's no, absolutely no evidence and no, no police data. There's no government data. There's no right wing think tank data. There's no left wing think tank data to, to, to demonstrate that when that, that a defunding project has led to harm or that the discourse of this defunding. Minneapolis, you keep ignoring what I'm saying to you. Minneapolis. I'm not ignoring. I'm not ignoring Minneapolis. I, I'm, I'm getting to Minneapolis. But I was making first. I was making a bigger argument about data because as a social scientist, sometimes people do this. I understand that correlation is not causation, but in this circumstance, it literally is. <laughs> I mean, it literally is the data that took place the moment they voted to defund the police. What has happened and what they are now doing to correct it, which is requesting more police. Can you address the mic? She's kind of micro. You know, this is the micro example. Yeah, I, I am. The but I, but I okay, to the, okay, go ahead. But let's. But actually, and, and, Minneapolis. Anecdotes, but just to be clear, anecdotes aren't data. Okay, so when people say data, that suggests that there was a study done or that there are formal statistics. And I'm saying, if there are statistics or data, just let me know where they are. Show me a site. Show me an, a a a. Because all I'm getting is stories. If, about if, if you if you get Mark, Mark. If to be fair, I mean, if if you say that the fire department is disbanded. And there are a hundred. There are a hundred more fires next month than the month. Like I, I think that's data. But but go ahead. No, okay, I understand that you might see that 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 seems uh, intuitive and self evident, axiomatic. But not actually, data. That's actually not what data is. That's that's absolutely not what data is. This is, this is the kind of denial that's only going to hurt black communities. I'm not in denial. I'm simply saying that that's not what data means. I mean, it's it's just not right. If, if, if when you say data, are you are you saying are you saying data in the sense that just like a, a reasonable argument? Your own people, your own Democrats that voted to defund the police disagree with you. So uh, people- I I haven't made my argument yet. I'm 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 sorry, Mark, we keep stepping on you. Let's, Mark, we're gonna, we keep stepping on Minneapolis. You know, right. no, so, we're, we're, the, the, the data that, thing, I'm gonna come back to this because I don't, I mean, uh, go ahead, go ahead. With Minneapolis in particular, first of all, uh, the argument, as I understand it, is that, first of all, when you look at the, the defunding budget, very little money was taken out of the budget, right? The bulk of the police departures we've seen is, is what Ken has pointed to, which is people saying, I don't want to do this, and people stepping down, right? Which is bad, but yeah, okay. Agreed, but that's not that's not the result of defunding. That's not the result of defunding. What I'm saying is that's not how defunding works. The, arg- the problem with that argument is that it suggests that when defunding is implemented, and, and people who want to defund get their way, right? And police are defunded, and the money's put the way it's supposed to go. That you get bedlam, right? Um, and what I'm saying is, is that that hasn't even, even if you were right, and I don't think you are, it hasn't had a chance to happen yet. What you saw instead was police protests to uh, the the idea of defunding, even though it was a very small line item, and almost no money was really taken out of the Minneapolis budget for actual policing. If you look at the actual numbers, but what you saw was police stepping down immediately, which does create a gap in, 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 in what's happening. I don't disagree that there's a gap that's happening in the streets, but that's not that's not what defunding looks like. That's my point. That's not what defunding looks like. Defunding doesn't look like firing all the police. Defunding doesn't look like 50, I'm just picking a number, 50 police officers walking off the job. That's not defunding. What you saw was police protesting what would have been a defunding project, and, and as a result, we saw the gap. So then, yes, it looks like that, right? If, 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 if I were to say, and I'll give you a concrete example. If I were to say, that um, change machines 
I'm going to change the snack machines in the police station. I decided, you know what, they need all healthy foods, right? And Because it'll make them work harder, they'll be more energetic, they can do their jobs better, they'll live longer. And police say, you know what, fuck this, I'm not doing this, and they all walk off the job, right? You can't then say that healthy snacks leads to the crime on the street that, that emerged when police weren't on the job. There is a connection between the two things, but, but, but the healthy food didn't cause it. The police walked off the job. Similarly, defunding didn't cause this. Police walked off the job. And, 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 well, it's, and it's more than, but to be fair, to be fair, if I may, it's more than the walk, the walk offs, usually or early retirements or what people because, you know, the way it goes, people get to their pension or whatever. That's, right. that's not what defunding is. I know, but, but I didn't. I, wait, 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 but this is the, the point I was going to make, Mark, is that they're not they they feel like they're not able to do the job because of the political decision that they will be defunded. It's about the political environment for cops to try yes. to do the work that they're doing. And as a re- but. But that comes from being told we're going to defund you. Like if someone says they're going to cut your salary 30 percent and then you feel like, I don't know if I should stay at this company or I don't know if I can do my job anymore. That's fair. But can, but can you agree then that that's not evidence that defunding didn't work? That the, the argument, the, the argument at the beginning of this exchange was that defunding was implemented and it led to high crime. And that's not true. Defunding never got a chance to be implemented. I think, I think whether the police walk off, right, or whether they're defunded to a place that they're off, it both presents your version of a utopia, which you just told us you were an abolitionist. You think that the ambulance should be showing up. So you believe in the absence of police in these circumstances anyways, right? So many no, no, right? So no. You, you said no. in a real situation, right? You believe that there should be other groups that are meant to deal with these with these scenarios. Did you not say that earlier? What you what you just described, what you just argued was, since I don't think police will be there anyway, then walking off is a comparable example. And I'm saying no, because in my in, in, in the world that I'm imagining, which again is a process, not a moment, the, the, the there would be at every level institutions designed to address this in the same spaces that police are right now. If, if I'm, people are still calling the police and there's just not enough people to get there, that's not what I, that's not what I'm describing. I'm describing a mental health institute. I'm, I'm, I'm a mental health establishment. I'm describing a situation where people's needs are met early on. I'm describing people who can arrive on the scene. None of those things are happening in Minneapolis. None of what defunding is supposed to look like is currently happening in Minneapolis. We and we haven't had a chance to get there yet. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I. I, I, I'm computing what you're saying. I just think it's tragically wrong, but I'm, I'm more than happy to let you talk yourself into that. Uh, I think we've reached an, I think we've reached an impasse on, on defund, uh, which is, which is not a, not a surprise. Um, guys, we're pretty much, we're, we're pretty much uh, at, at time for the week. I just want to say uh, to first, first off to, to Candace, why don't you tell everybody who's watching slash listening? Uh, what are things, you know, what are things to look for in Candace's world? What's on, what's on your mind? What's top of, uh, I mean, I, I got one thing I'm sure you're thinking about, but what's going on? <laughs> uh, you know, just uh, if you like to follow my work, you know where to find me on social media. Uh, you can buy my book, Blackout. We've been on the New York Times bestseller list for the last eight weeks, which has been amazing. Um, and I am moving to Tennessee and joining the Daily Wire. So all very exciting things on the horizon. Nashville is, pr- Mark, I think we could agree. Nashville has great music and great food. It, it does, and Michael Eric Dyson is is t- taking on a professorship at Vanderbilt, so you guys can like hang out now and and, so and, good. and agree on everything. Everything. I mean, I'm going to say this: <laughs> uh, Candice, Candice, and Michael Eric Dyson sitting down and and videotaping that discussion, you know, over whatever your preferred <laughs> cuisine in Nashville. That would actually be a very uh, that would be very worthwhile. Um, <laughs> and congrats on the Daily Wire. Give my old my old colleague uh, Matt Walsh uh, regards. He's a uh, He's, a, he's, a, he's a, the closest thing, I think, that exists to Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec. I think it is Matt Walsh. <laughs> who's uh, my hero, by the way. Who's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, so that's a high compliment I'm paying to Matt yeah, Walsh for sure. Mark, what's the thing that you're doing where they talk about the thing? Tell everybody. <laughs> oh, yeah. You, I, know, I know earlier we were talking about on Twitter. Yeah, I, I was getting a little bit of criticism because on December uh, 15th, I'm, I'm participating in a, a panel uh, on how to dismantle uh, yes. anti-semitism yes uh, uh sponsored by jewish voices for peace and you know there was some criticism about the people on the panel we should talk about that next week actually It'd be a really interesting conversation yeah. uh you know part of it was were there enough jewish people on the panel another question is are we uh, good faith actors on this question because of our position on, pal- on palestine um lots lots of questions coming up about it but it's a panel with me rashida talib uh peter beinart uh, and uh, and a Professor Barbara Ransby from uh, UIC. So uh, I think it'll be fun. We're, we're obviously all committed to dismantling anti-Semitism uh, wherever it pops up. 
uh, and having a real conversation about what solidarity with Jewish communities should look like and can look like and to listening to Jewish voices. Um, so I'm excited to be a part of it. But, you know, there's some pushback from uh, the right. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to, to have that conversation, too. But it, but, it, but it'll be interesting. All right, cool. Um, well, yeah, I, I remember people used, to, people used to come up to me all the time when I, my first years in media when I came out of the CIA's counterterrorism center, and they'd be like, "You're you're a you're a terrorism specialist, right?" And I was like, "Uh, <laughs> <my laughs> counterterrorism? <laughs> like, I don't do yeah, it terrorism." Mean what you think it means, right? <laughs> but like, fuck, you know a lot about terrorism. Like, how do you build the bombs? I'm like, no, that's not. It's I not don't what do I do. that. Yeah, I do the other thing. I do the stopping. Like you do the stopping of the anti-Semitism. I do the stopping of the terrorism. Right. I used to. Right. We're trying um, to end it all. But yeah, I'm ever, ever, and please do. Uh, if you, if you're enjoying this, uh, subscribe. Uh, we, we are hoping we can entice Candace to, to come back and join us again because this was a lot of fun and we could have done this for a lot longer. Uh, you go to QuakeMedia.com/slash/Mark. QuakeMedia.com/slash/Buck. Uh, either just subscribe to our show. That's what we care about. We want more people um, and checking out everybody on Quake and Candace. As advertised, so much fun to have you on. Really appreciate it. And I mean, I will just say this right now: having you two. I mean, I you know I'm a part of this discussion as well. But I mean, having the, the, this this conversation that happened on these issues is a a higher level, more worthwhile, better conversation than I have heard on this in in years. Honestly, that's my oh. honest honest to god opinion. So from both sides of it, you know, to actually hear people who know what they're doing. So that's what we try to do here. Candice, thank you so much, and, and good luck, by the way. Thank you guys for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, make sure again, check out this book. It's called We Still Here, Pandemic, Policing, Protest, and Possibility. I'm not on the New York Times bestseller list, so I have to do a hard sell. But uh, check it out. Uh, and we're all looking forward to seeing you uh, next week. We're having a lot more. Yep. If you buy his book, you can just put an apostrophe R-E in. Yes. <laughs> all right. All right.